here today to kill your child, commonly known as abortion or pro-choice, you need to understand the consequences. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. You're killing a child this morning. Some of you are still sitting out in your cars waiting for your appointment to kill your child. Some of those of you who are out in your cars are cowardly fathers for allowing your children to be murdered and butchered inside this building. Some of you are here to provide quote unquote moral support as your friend or family member goes inside and slaughters their unborn child. That's not moral support, that's immoral support. That's wicked, ungodly support. You need to understand the consequences for your actions. The Bible says no murder will inherit the kingdom of God. Every murder shall be cast into the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. You need to understand the consequences of your actions because you've been deceived. You've been fooled, you've been tricked to believing there's nothing wrong with what you're doing here this morning if you're here to kill your child. You've been led to believe it's not even a child. You've been deceived. Someone is a child from conception. Sure, they're underdeveloped, but so is the two-year-old you may have in your car at home. So is the teenager who hasn't finished puberty. They're underdeveloped. Oh, but they, they need my body to live. Well, so does a newborn baby who nurses from their mom's, the mother's breast. So does a five-year-old who has no way of taking care of him or herself, providing for him or herself. Do we logically now kill them as well or have the right to kill them as well? You've been deceived because the American legal system, American law system has decided that you have the right to kill your baby. That you have the right to take your baby to this wicked place and allow so-called doctors and nurses inside to butcher your baby and throw him or her in the trash. That's not true. Doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says or any other court of men says, the Supreme Court with God as the judge, jury, and executioner has already decided and he will not change his mind. God changes not. Killing babies is a sin. It's a sin. What you're doing here this morning is wicked. And don't comfort yourself with the lie, oh, we all sin every day, we can't help it. That's not true. True Christians don't sin every day. They live holy, blameless lives. Obeying God, obeying Jesus, keeping his commandments. That's what a real Christian does. Some of you have deceived yourself into believing because you go to a building on Sunday, maybe even on Wednesday, maybe you forsake and go into the building altogether, maybe just watch it online now. Because you go or attend some religious services, even ones that claim to be Christian, that you're right with God in the midst of your wickedness. This is not true. This is not true. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. The Bible says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient. You see, God can wipe away your sins. He can wash away your sins by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The only 
stain remover for sin there is that'll actually work. But you must be willing and obedient. You must forsake your sins. You must seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That's what God offers you. He offers you mercy and pardon and forgiveness and cleansing. But you must repent. You must seek him. You must really, truly repent. Give up your sin. Go the other direction. Go the other way. Stop it. Stop your sinning. No matter what your sinning may be, stop it. And we all know, no one's deceived here today. We all know that your, your sin here today your sin of wanting to kill your unborn child. You came to this point because of other sin. You came to this point because of lust. You came to this point because of sex outside of marriage. You came to this point because you do not treasure unborn lives. That life is just as important as your life is. That baby, that child deserves the right to live. That baby, that child has nothing wrong to deserve your death penalty, to deserve your judgment, your wrath upon them. There are many people according to the scriptures who deserve the judgment and wrath of God, but innocent, unborn babies is not on the list. In fact, Jesus said about children now, he said, do not forbid them from coming to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus said, he said, unless you humble yourself and become like a child, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So the, the ones who you come here to destroy and to kill, the ones you come here to destroy and to, and to kill, are the ones who Jesus lifts up as examples of what you should be and become in order to become one of his followers. And the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he will return and he will deal with you in righteousness. If you're here today to kill your child, change your mind. Don't do it. At least give your child up for adoption. At least give your child up for adoption. There's people who are waiting to adopt a child. People. He will care for your child. Protect your child. Provide for your child. Give them a good life. But don't kill your child. It's not, a, it's not one of the options. People try to make as if it's pro-choice versus pro-life. Well, I'm both. I believe in choices. You have lots of choices. You can be abstinent, which means not have sex before marriage. You can give your child up for adoption. You can become a mother, a father. But one option you do not have is killing that child. That child has value. Why? Because that child is made in the image of God. That child is a creation of God. The Bible says that they, fear, they are fearfully and wonderfully made. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible teaches that Jesus is knitting them together in their mother's womb. Here the work of God is being done and you're here to destroy the work of God. And there will be repercussions. I was just reading a story on, on a news story just yesterday or the day before on the internet of this lady who came to get a first uh, trimester abortion, a vacuum aspiration abortion, one of the ones that they actually do here, and she died. She died of blood hemorrhaging in her fallopian tubes and in her uterus. She passed. Those were the consequences for her action. The Bible says you will reap what you sow. If you sow to please the flesh, you will reap destruction. If you sow to please the spirit, 
Give your everlasting life. Oh, there's no good reason to be a sinner. There's no good reason to be a sinner at all, let alone to murder an unborn child. It is your own flesh and blood. The child has half your DNA, half the father's DNA, half the mother's DNA. And you're here to destroy it. You're paying someone to destroy it. You know, last year, the big uproar around America is Black Lives Matter. I've been coming to this abortion clinic for over a year now, almost a year and a half. And ratio speaking, percentage speaking, more people who've come here who have darker color skin than anybody else. So my question, if you believe in the movement Black Lives Matter, which black lives matter? How about the unborn black lives? How about those precious lives? The, unbo the unborn black lives, those, do those lives matter? Don't, don't sit there on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, or TikTok, or whatever, Snapchat, whatever social media you want to, to be on. Don't sit there and tell me you believe black lives matter while you're coming here to kill a black life. You're coming here to kill a black life. And George Floyd, the one who's most well known for the, all the uproar last year, you know what he cried out when that, that unjust cop put a knee on his neck for an unjustly period of time, an unrighteous period of time? He cried out for his mama. He said, I can't breathe. And here we have mamas killing their children. Where is the uproar about this? Unborn lives matter. That's what I'll tell you. Unborn lives matter. Maybe not to you, but to God. Unborn lives matter to God. Unborn lives matter to me. They matter to Jesus. You know, the Bible says that Jesus came to give life and life abundantly. Jesus came to give life. You're here to take a life. Jesus came to give life. You're here to snuff out a life. But the devil, he comes to kill to steal and to destroy and what are you here to do to kill a child to steal his or her life to destroy his or her chance of living in this world and it's ungodly it's unrighteous it's not what god would want you to do god is calling you to repentance today there's organizations that will truly help you, that will help you even financially with this child. Although for many of you, I don't think you need financial help. What you need is a reorganizing of the money you already do have. Stop spending your money on alcohol and cigarettes and drugs and cars and phones and cable TV and spend your money on your child who you came here to kill. Spend your money on your child who you came here to kill if you're here for an abortion. Some of you may be here for other services. My question for you is this. If you know that this place makes money off the blood of unborn children, that is their primary source of income seven days a week, why would you ever even consider giving them your money for anything else? I would never do that. If I knew someone who I was buying from or getting services from and paying them for their services was killing babies for a living, was slaughtering unborn child, children for a living, you better believe I wouldn't give them a penny of my money. You better believe it. I'm not going to support that trash, that nonsense, that garbage. My prayer for the owner of this clinic is that the she goes bankrupt. That the organization behind this clinic goes bankrupt and cannot recover. Because their money is blood money. In the very beginning with Adam and Eve, their first two sons were Cain and Abel. And they both came before God to bring offering, offerings to God. And Cain's offering was not accepted, but Abel's offering was. It was more righteous before God than Cain's offering. And that made Cain angry. And so God said to Cain, why are you angry? 
and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And that's what God is saying to you today. Sin lies at the door. Temptation to commit this heinous sin of killing your child lies at the door. And it desires you to go through with it, to kill that child. But you have a way out right now. God has sent a man of God here today to tell you the truth, to preach to you the truth. Think about it. How many people in the midst of their sin, when they're about to commit a sin, which will have severe earthly temporal consequences, which will have severe eternal heavenly consequences. How many people in the midst of committing a sin or about to commit a sin have someone come and warn them on a megaphone not to do it? Who quote the scripture to them and plead with them to spare their child's life, to not commit the sin they're about to commit? You have a way out today. You can walk out, you can get up and walk out of that clinic. You can do what is right. It can start today. No matter what anyone says, no matter what happens, do the right thing. Do not slaughter, do not kill that child. Do not take away his or her life. Is it not amazing to you? Is it not astonishing to you? And there's a man here who cares more about the life of your child than you do yourself. Don't even know you. Don't even know your child. And I'd even be willing to adopt your child. I have eight children. Been married for 20 years. I've sacrificed a lot for my children. Sleep, money, time, energy. For my children. And if it, if it takes this to get you to not kill your child, I will adopt your child. All of your excuses are eliminated. You have no excuses. And even the ones you did have were not sufficient. They would not hold up in the court of God's law. When you stand before God on judgment day and you say, well, I couldn't afford the child. The child is gonna mess up my life, gonna inconvenience my life. God will not receive those justifications. God will not receive those judgments from you. He will not say, okay, you're right, no big deal. You killed a child, come on in. He's not going to do that. Don't deceive yourself. God is going to judge you in righteousness. Even in a case of rape or incest, which is less than 1% of the time, the people give an abortion, the reason people get an abortion less than 1% of the time is rape and incest. Even in those cases, do you kill a child for the sin of the father? And what legal system is that fair and righteous and just to kill a person for the sin their father committed? None. Don't kill your child. Don't go through with it. Do what is right. Let the child live. Your parents let you live. Don't be a hypocrite and take the life of your own child. That child deserves a chance to live. Here we are. We're, we live in America, the land of the free. But it's a shame that people aren't allowed the freedom to be born. We live in the land of freedom, the land of the free. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom to bear arms. Freedom to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But you're stealing those rights from this child. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And that child, if he or she could speak for him or herself and say to you what they desire to happen this morning, 100% without question, would say, let me live. Don't kill me. But you know why abortion, the murdering of unborn children and infanticide has become so acceptable in our world? Because that little voice can't speak for him or herself. Unborn children are, are voiceless, innocent, defenseless, weak, vulnerable. 
and yet you come here to pay to snuff them out. You can tell a lot about someone by how they treat a human being who cannot stand up for themselves, who can't help themselves. I'm going to ask yourself this question. If you saw an old man, an old lady in a supermarket who couldn't reach something, who couldn't put their groceries in their car, would you not stop and help them? Would you not care enough for them who are helpless to stop and help them? Yet they can speak up for themselves. These babies cannot. And the way people, the way a society, the way a culture treats its most vulnerable really shows forth its character. And since Roe versus Wade, over 60 million babies have been slaughtered in a mother's womb. 60 million. And one of the arguments back then that still goes around today is, well, women are going to get an abortion anyway. Why not make it safe for them? That's like saying, well, people who murder people in gas stations and rob gas stations are going to do it anyway. Why not make safe passage for them? Not only to kill the store owner, but to rob all his money. I am not, God is not, and no man should be in the business of making criminal activity safe. One of the hindrances, one of the deterrents of criminal activity is the threat it brings upon a criminal's life. One of the things that says stop you, deter you from committing a crime, is that it's not safe. It's what could happen to you if you go through with it and take the life of that child and commit that crime. No, I'm not in the business of making crime safe. If a woman wants to kill her child, let it be as unsafe as possible. Let it be as deadly as possible. Maybe that will change her mind. Maybe it'll stop her from wanting to kill her child. Maybe it'll stop her from being a murderer and, and change her heart to want to be a mother instead. Or at least bring the child to term, give birth to the child, and give the child up for adoption. You know, the number of, children, number of people who are waiting to adopt children is almost the same exact number as those who have an abortion every year. The number of babies who are aborted every year is almost the same exact number of those waiting to adopt children. Killing your child is not a funny thing. It's a shameful thing. It's a vile thing. It's a wicked thing to kill your child. To go through with murdering the unborn, the innocent, the voiceless, the weak, the vulnerable. All the blood shed in this place. All the blood money earned. I'll tell you, if I was a nurse or a doctor in this place and I found out what they were doing, killing babies, I'd rather be poor and homeless and die of starvation than kill a child. My eight children, I laid my life down for them. If someone tried to harm them, they'd have to kill me first. I'll do whatever I can to help them, provide for them, love them, protect them. Anything I can within God's realm of options, within the word of God's realm of options, I'll do that to protect my child. And all you had to do this morning to protect your child was stay home. There's nothing extravagant that you had to do this morning to protect your vulnerable, innocent, voiceless, unborn baby. Simply don't get up. Simply don't get in the car. Or right now, if you're already here, simply get up and go home. There's nothing extravagant about that. You get up and go places all the time. You get up from bed and go to work. You get up from bed and go to the fast food restaurant. You get up from bed and go to the, the grocery store. You get up from bed and go to the gas station. Get up from that chair and go home. Don't kill your child, your precious child that God loves, that Jesus died for, and Jesus died for you too. But he died for all. 
that those who live would live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. The Bible says Jesus was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes you can be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So upon Jesus, our sins were laid. And he was beaten, he was bruised, he was beaten. He was mocked, he was spit upon. He is dead, he was buried, and he rose from the grave on the third day, defeating death. And now he commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Are you ready? Are you ready to be judged by God? Are you prepared to meet your maker? If you're in sin, you're not. If you're here to kill your baby, you're not. This is an abortion clinic, sir. If you're here to kill your baby, you're not ready. You're not ready to stand before God. And as I said earlier, I realize there may be some here who are not here to have an abortion. They're here for women's services. But why would you come here to get women's services from this place? No matter how good the reviews, no matter how inexpensive, if they're killing babies for a living, if they're offering you their services at a low cost, you want to know why? They kill babies for a living. They have blood money. And the blood of babies upon their hands. You know how they kill babies here? Well, according to them, they only do it two different ways, but I find it hard to believe. You kill babies for a living, it's hard for me to believe anything you say. If you kill babies for a living, you'll lie too, very easily, very quickly, with no shame. But according to their website, they kill by two different ways. They give the woman a poisonous pill, which she swallows. And then later on, they give her a second pill, which finally kills the baby. And the second way they kill babies, besides poisoning the child via the mouth of the mother, is they do vacuum aspiration. They literally vacuum the child out of the mother's womb. Vacuum them out. You know, I, I, have a, I have a house at home. We have a large family. We have a vacuum cleaner. You know what we vacuum up? Trash. We vacuum garbage off the floor. Stuff we don't want. And then we empty the canister into the garbage. Is that how you feel about your children? You're coming to a, a board here this morning? You think they're garbage? You think they're worthy of being put into a dumpster? Or maybe this abortion clinic is one of those abortion clinics that sells the body parts for experimentation. But either way, when they vacuum your child out of the womb, they have to reconstruct the child's body to make sure they got it all out. And if they didn't, it could be disastrous for you. You could die if they leave any part of the child in your womb. Are you verifying they got it all out? As I said earlier, I read an article recently of a woman, and it's not a, a rare thing by any means, but a woman died after having an abortion. She was hemorrhaging within her. Her fallopian tubes, her uterus was hemorrhaging. They brought her to the hospital because of the, the, um, the bleeding that she was going through. And she, she ended up dying from it. So she killed her baby, became a murderer, and then she herself died. The Bible says, you reap what you sow. Don't be deceived. There are consequences for your actions. If you're here to kill your child this morning, there are consequences for your actions. God is going to deal with you in truth. There are not, not only earthly, temporal consequences, the possibility of death, of severe blood loss, the possibility of never being able to have a child naturally, 
These are all things that are possible for you. But the worst possible consequence for your action is not earthly, it's not temporal, it's the eternal consequences. For God, if you don't repent, if you don't come to Christ by faith and forsake your sinning, the Bible says that God will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You see the difference? God's going to separate the righteous and the unrighteous on judgment day. And Jesus said in John 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So your church going, your church attendance will help you nothing on judgment day. You're getting baptized or confirmed or asking Jesus into your heart or praying a sinner's prayer will not make you right with God. God is calling you to repentance. The Bible says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. That times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. The Bible says, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. The Bible says, a solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you're here today to kill your child, you understand abortion is wicked in God's eyes. It matters not to God what the world says. It matters not to God what the lawmakers say of America. It matters not to God what the majority says. It matters not to God what the Supreme Court says. God says abortion is wrong and God changes not. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he changes not. He will not change his mind. Abortion is sin. Killing your child is a sin. And once again, if you're here today to have other women's services done besides an abortion, you don't understand who you're dealing with. These doctors, these nurses, they kill babies for a living seven days a week. They have babies' lives terminated. Who knows how many thousands of babies have been killed in this one building? Who knows how many? So you need to understand, these, these people are killing babies for a living and care not for the lives of babies and the temporal earthly effects, consequences that may happen upon the mothers who bring their babies to the slaughter on the altar of convenience. If they don't care about them, what makes you think they care about you? Watch it. They may try to convince you to kill your baby too. It's quick, easy money for them. And who knows how much money they're getting on the back end. Who knows if they're selling baby parts of your baby to someone else for experimentation. It's happening all over the world. We know this for a fact. It's been exposed. It's been exposed in the last few years that these things are happening all over the place. It's not only do they make money on your abortion, on you killing your child, they make money on the back end selling things. That's what most abortion clinics do. And it shouldn't surprise us. I mean, listen, what's, what, uh, what will they not do if they'll kill babies for a living? What will they not do? Name something that's more heinous than killing voiceless, defenseless, innocent, unborn, weak children. I mean, if someone went down a neighborhood around this area and took all the two-year-olds they could find out of a house and shot them in the head, would you turn the other way? 
Would you think it was okay? Oh, because they're two and a gun was used, now it's not okay? So the method used, the, the weapon used is what really matters? Let's say instead they had this huge vacuum cleaner. It was going down the street of a, of a close local neighborhood. And they said to the parents, parents, if you don't want your child who's five years old and younger, just put them in the front yard at such and such a time. You don't even have to tell them what's going to happen. And we'll bring our big vacuum cleaner and suck them up. And you'll never have to deal with them again. You'll never have the inconvenience of them. You'll never have to raise them another day. You'll have to pay another penny for anything they need or want. Would that be okay? Now it's not okay because they're five? Listen, that unborn child is dependent upon the mother just like the five-year-old is. They're dependent upon the father just like the five-year-old is. And you have no good excuse to go forward with this abortion. Ma'am, are you here for an abortion today? Ma'am, are you here for an abortion today to kill your child? To terminate your child's life? To snuff them out? To destroy them? Is there any chance they have of life? Their blood is on your hands if you go through with it. And it's not as if there is not forgiveness and grace available to murderers. The Apostle Paul called himself the chief of sinners because he persecuted the church of God. But if people told the Apostle Paul while he was standing by watching them stoned to death, the deacon Stephen, and while he dragged Christians off to prison, he believed it was okay. When he became a follower of Jesus, he was full of much grief and sorrow because of what he had done to his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, now that he was a follower of Jesus himself. But now you kill worse. The Apostle Paul, who called himself the chief of sinners, he was dragging off the prison adults. People who are alive, who could defend themselves, who could run away, who could speak up for themselves. That's who he was persecuting, but yet you persecute someone who cannot speak up for themselves. How weak can you be? How cold-hearted can you be? How hard-hearted can you be to go forward with this, taking the life of your own child? You need to know if you've only taken one pill so far, there's a way to reverse it. You've only taken one pill so far to kill that child of yours. There's a way to reverse it. Killing unborn children is wicked. It's ungodly. It's unrighteous. Every time I come here, I see dozens of women go in there to kill their children. It's a shame. I have a solution for you. Keep your pants on and your legs closed. Keep your pants on and your legs closed. Stop using killing babies as a form of birth control. Don't come here and sacrifice your child on the altar of convenience you can keep on in your sexual perversion and your wickedness. God's going to deal with you. The Bible says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. The evil that you're doing here today and killing your child, God will bring it into judgment. You seek to hide it from people. You come here in the morning in this brick building, undisclosed brick building. You think you're hiding your sin, maybe from family members or friends or church members you know, but you're not hiding it from God. And ultimately, that's what matters. You're not hiding your sin from God. Doesn't matter how many people you get to agree with you about this sin, God will never agree with it. And on Judgment Day, God will not judge you according to the standard of somebody else. God will judge you according to His perfect and holy standard, His Word. What will you do then? Who will you appeal to on that day? Will you gather together friends and family members and co-workers who will agree with your decision to kill your child? And even if you could, what good would it do? 
when God's not only pointed a finger at you, but at them for encouraging you and supporting you in your sin. You have nothing to say. You have no answer to give. This God is just. He is fair. He's not determined what, how he judges based upon majority. He does not change his law because sinners want to keep being sinners. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. The same God who destroyed the world with the flood it still exists. He, has not, he changes not. He has not changed his character. And you know why God flooded the world and destroyed all the humans except for eight of them? Because every intent of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. I wonder. We have not record of it. But I wonder, were they killing their children back then too? It wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise they had all kinds of technology back then that even we have today. They lived to be over 900 years old back then. Lots of things can be figured out in 900 years. But every intent of the thought of their heart was only evil continually. And every intent of the thought of your heart towards this child is only evil continually. You may say, well, it was, it was just a hard choice to make. Now, there's nothing hard about coming here in the morning and paying someone to terminate your child. That's wicked. It's depraved. And God is calling you to repentance. He's calling you to go and sin no more. So the same God who wiped out all the humans except for eight, the same God who's going to come in judgment, he changes not. He promised he will not flood the world again. And the rainbow is a sign of his promise. Every time you see a rainbow, you should thank God that he doesn't flood this world again and destroy it for its wickedness and sin. But the same God who wiped Sodom and Gomorrah off the face of the planet because of their wickedness, the same God who still lives, and why did he wipe Sodom and Gomorrah off the face of the planet? Because they were wicked. You say, oh, that's just a Bible story. You know what? I went to Israel. I've been to the ruins of Gomorrah. The brimstone is still there. I found two pieces. I burned them myself on camera on the spot. Don't tell me it didn't happen. The purest brimstone the purest sulfur in all the world is found in a desert in Israel? Why is that? Because God set his pure and righteous judgment upon those places. Because they would not repent. He even had two of his angels go down there before he did it to rescue Lot, his wife, and his daughters. And to see if it was really like he had heard. And what did they try to do to the angel? They tried to sodomize them. Tried to engage in sexual perversion with the two angels. So they blinded them and got Lot, his wife, and his daughters out of the city. And unfortunately, Lot's wife disobeyed the angel of God and turned back and turned to a pillar of salt, which is still there to this day. These things are signposts. They're warning. And what God will do with this place. You might say in your, your heart, well, why hasn't God brought judgment yet? Where is the judgment of God I've heard about for so many years, for so long a time? The Bible says God is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. But is long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. God is not indifferent about your sin. God is not indifferent about the judgment you deserve for your sin. What's the reason why he hasn't brought his judgment yet? Because he's being patient towards you. Long-suffering towards you. Not willing that you should perish. But that you should come to repentance. That's what God wants for you. To come to repentance. To forsake your sins to fling yourself upon the mercy of God found in the cross of Jesus Christ. For it's by grace you are saved, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But the scripture makes it clear 
God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Why give your service, why give your money to this place that destroys babies for a living? Why give your money, your time, your services to a place that destroys babies for a living? What justification can you give me to help this place stay open? To give them a good review on Google? What justification can you give to continue to support this place of blood money? If you knew a place owned by a mafia who killed innocent people for a living and terrorized innocent people for a living, would you keep being a frequenter of that place and giving your money and your business? Shame on you, sinner. Repent. Is that your IQ? Repent. Turn to God. Do what is right. Forsake your sins. God will not hold him guiltless who sheds innocent blood. God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I've even met professing Christians who've come here to kill their child. You don't understand, if you're here to sin and kill your child, you're not a Christian. No murderer has eternal life abiding in him, the Bible says. No murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And the Bible says in 1 John 3.15, whoever hates his brother, he is a murderer at heart. You need to understand that you're a murderer, that you're here to commit today if you're here to have an abortion. Your murder that you're here to commit today started with hatred for that child. You hate that child because of what that child will do to you, the inconveniences they'll bring in your life, the amount of money they'll take, time they'll take, energy they'll take, and you hate that child, shame on you. God's going to deal with you, you murderer. God's going to deal with you. You may say, well, I got all the time in the world to get right with God. I'm still young. I have my whole life in front of me. I agree, you have your whole life in front of you, but your whole life can be one more minute. Your whole life can be one more day. Your whole life can be one more week. That woman who I read about, an article about recently, who died from the abortion, I think she died two days after the abortion was performed. She probably, she was a young lady in her 20s. She probably thought she had her whole life ahead of us. I have so many years to live my life and to sin, and now I have freedom without this child to keep doing what I want to do. And she died. And the Bible says, whereas you do not know, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. The thing going on today, the thing to do is vaping. I'm gonna vape, I'm not gonna smoke cigarettes anymore, I'm gonna vape instead, it's so cool. I got this thing I can put in my mouth, there's different flavors, all this vape comes out, the smoke comes out. You're destroying your lungs, by the way. But every time you vape or see someone vape and you see that vape come out of their mouth and then it just fades away. Within a few feet of their mouth, it just fades away. You can't even see it anymore. The Bible says your life is like that. Your life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. What will happen when your life vanishes away? What will you do then when God calls you to give an account of your life? When God calls you to repentance? The Bible says today is a day of salvation. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. If you hear the voice of God, the voice of the scriptures speaking to you, do not harden your heart. Soften your heart. Soften your heart to the word of God. Do what is right. Don't kill the child. Stop having sex outside of marriage which brought you to this place in the first place. Stop lusting after men and women. Get right with God. He will change your heart. He will change your mind. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. 
All the old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Now, if Jesus Christ hadn't changed me 24 years ago from what I was to what I am, I might be one of the ones paying for an abortion here today. I've been following Jesus Christ for over half my life now, 24 years. He's been so good to me. He changed me from a drunkard to a sober person from a liar to an honest person, from a thief to a content person, from lustful to pure, from hateful to loving, from selfish to unselfish. So Jesus Christ can do in your life too. He can change you. He can transform you. He'll give you a love for that child, a love that you'll lay your life down for that child. Instead of loving your own wicked life and laying the child's life down for you and your wicked life, you'll lay your own life down for that child and not kill him or her, not destroy him or her, but do what is right. God will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a heart that's soft, that's moldable to his will. That's what God seeks to do for you today to give you a heart that is soft towards his will, towards obedience to him. A heart that's not hard because of your sin. You know, sin has a hardening effect upon your heart. Sin hardens. It's like the sun hitting clay. It bakes it. It makes it hard. And clay is like a sinner who has a heart full of sin. But God can remove from you your sin. John the Baptist, the greatest man born among women according to Jesus, he said this about Jesus, and behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world. He wants to take away your sins. Now says Christ was manifested in the flesh that he might destroy the works of the devil. When you sin, you're not doing God's work. You're doing the devil's work. And Jesus came to destroy that work. How does it get destroyed? By you coming to repentance. You stop resisting him and surrender to him. You give your whole life to him and do what is right. And he will change you. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will make you new. He will give you eternal life as a free gift. And from there on out, you'll live a holy life if you continue to follow Jesus. You know, Jesus said this in Mark 9. He says, anyone who wants to come after me, anyone who wants to follow me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever desires to lose his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. And what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then Jesus said this, if you are ashamed of me and my words, this adulterous and sinful generation of you, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I think I said Mark 9. It's actually Mark 8. It's Mark 8. It's the words of Jesus towards you. Stop taking up your life and trying to preserve your way of life. Lay down your life for Jesus in the gospel. Now, I, rec I realize that many of you young people were not raised in a household with a mother and a father. You don't have godly examples to look up to, to tell you the truth, to model the truth for you. And so you think that it's normal to have sex outside of marriage and do whatever you want to do and get pregnant and have an abortion and get pregnant and have an abortion and not take care of your children, not raise your children in the Word of God. That is not normal. Just because most people do it doesn't make it normal. It's still unrighteous. 
The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. You see the comparison there? Many are on the path to destruction. Few are on the path of life. So many, the most, are going the wrong way. Most are doing things the wrong way. Very few do things the right way. So if you look at your life and examine yourself, I'm not much different than everybody else. Well, that's not a, that's not a commendation for you. You don't deserve applaud for that because you're quote unquote normal and like everybody else in this world. That's exactly the opposite what God would have you to do. God would have you to do what is right. And the Bible says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch the unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. If you really are a follower of Christ, what you'll do, you'll depart from iniquity. We live within a pretty close range of the Atlanta airport. We can hear them flying overhead. And when that plane departs from the airport, the whole plane goes. Both wings, the tail wing, the body of the plane, it all departs. If any part is left behind, that plane is in danger. And when Jesus says, or the Bible says, you must depart from iniquity, it's talking about all your iniquity, all of your sin, not just some of it. Okay, God, I won't get drunk anymore, but I'm going to keep on fornicating. Okay, God, I won't smoke pot anymore, but I'm going to have this abortion. Okay, God, I, I'll stop being lazy. I'll get a job and work for a living. But I'm going to keep being a liar and a thief. No, you must depart from iniquity. And the Bible says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. And believe me, if you're here to kill a baby, you have an overflow. You have an overflow of wickedness. And you come to the point where you'll kill your unborn child. You'll come to the point where you'll kill an unborn child. That's extreme wickedness. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness, and this is filthy, an overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Many of you, you maybe have grown up in the church, You've heard some facet of the truth, some portion of the truth, but you don't obey God, and you think you're a Christian. You're deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Deceiving yourself. So many are deceiving themselves because they hear the word and don't do it. You're like a man who looks in the mirror according to the book of James. Like a man who looks in the mirror and immediately you walk away and forget what you look like. Look into the mirror of God's law. See yourself in truth. The Bible says, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Stop right there. Some of you think in your heart, your foolish hearts, that the unrighteous will inherit the kingdom of God. When the Bible directly says, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then it says this, and such were, past tense, were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. It is God's will you become a mother, not a murderer. It is God's will you become a father, not a coward. It is God's will you do what is right. No matter how that child in the womb was conceived, no matter what manner was used, whether a husband and wife, boyfriend or girlfriend, one night stand, incest, rape, no matter what mode, what means was used to conceive that child, that child's a blessing from God. That child does not deserve to be killed. That child is made in God's image. They're fearfully and wonderfully made. That child, him or herself, is not a sin. That child, him or herself, can be a blessing to you, but you treat him or her like a cursing by slaughtering them in the womb. The place in the world where it's supposed to be the safest place for an unborn child, completely designed and created by God to be the place the child will be until they come into this world for safety, for protection, for nutrition, for growth. It's become the most dangerous place in the world. As babies are killed by the millions, the tens of millions. So the place that God intended to be the safest place in the world for an unborn child, you have made into the most dangerous place. Why? Because you're a murderous mother. It's a very nurturing mother. And know this, you killing your child will not stop you from being a mother or a father. You're still a mother. You're a mother or father from conception. Now you're the mother of a murdered child, which you paid the hitman to kill. You're the father of a murdered child, which you paid the hitman to slaughter and take out. You're still a mother or father. You're a mother or father of a homicided child. One of you had part in. Oh, what a conspiracy. What a conspiracy. People who can't speak for themselves, can't stand up for themselves, can't even run away, and they're slaughtered by the tens of millions. What a conspiracy. This is systemic. This right here is systemic. Not racism. This is systemic. The slaughtering of babies. Where are the parades? Where are the marches? For these children, we did nothing wrong, did nothing good or evil, not deserving of such treatment, but yet you give it to them. Don't go through with it. No matter what's peer, how much peer pressure you have, how much pressure you have from family members, friends, co-workers, church members, God forbid, church members influence you to kill your child. No matter how much peer pressure you have, how much bad influence you have in your life to kill your child, don't do it because it's wrong. Stand up for life. Stand up for truth. Stand up for righteousness. Do what is right. Don't kill that child. There are organizations, people who really care about you, who don't support their organizations on blood money. They'll give you doctor's appointments. They'll give you ultrasounds for free. They'll help you financially to bring this child to term and at the least give the child up for adoption. You say, well, I can't bear giving my child up, but you can bear killing him, killing her. You can't bear letting someone else raise the child you don't want, but you can bear killing him or her. Oh, their blood cries out to you from the ground. It's like Abel's blood cried out to God from the ground and what Cain did to him. And someday they will have their vengeance. Someday God will make this all right. And if you don't repent, 
and you don't give up your sin and turn to Christ for mercy, forgiveness, for newness of life, it'll be a terrible day for you, a terrible day of reckoning for all the murderous mothers and fathers or the cowardly mothers and fathers. It's going to be a day of reckoning for sinners who refuse to do what is right. The Bible says that man who is born of woman, man who is born of woman, is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Your life is going to end eventually. And none of us, none of us know the day of our death. None of us know when we're going to die. But with that fact in mind, see then that you walk this life carefully. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. If you're here today to kill your child, you, you're doing the exact opposite of redeeming the time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your life. And you're giving in to the evil instead of walking away from evil. You're giving in to the evil to kill your child. I plead with you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. I plead with you on Christ's behalf. Forsake your sins. Turn in faith to Christ. Be born again. Receive the Spirit of God. He will change you. He will make you into the person that God wants you to be. Instead of who the devil wants you to be and who you want to be. The Bible says draw near to God. The Bible says draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. See, God loves humility. You humble yourself, he lifts you up. You stay in your pride, God says he opposes the proud. He's against the proud. He resists the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. The Bible says adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know? Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Who therefore is a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. Are you here today to kill your child? Are you here today to kill your child, your unborn child? Don't do it. They are voiceless. I'm trying to be the voice of that unborn child, pleading with you not to go through with it. You know if that child had a voice, he or she could speak to you. They would cry out to you with the ever strength they had to stop it, to not do it. Don't swallow that pill, mommy. Don't let them stick that vacuum inside of you and vacuum me out like I'm trash. Do what is right, I promise, mommy. I'll be a good boy, a good girl. I won't cause you any trouble. That's what they'd say if they could speak. Are you here today to kill your child? You know it's not right, ma'am. It's not right to kill your baby. You drive around in an expensive vehicle, and you come here to kill your child. It's obvious by your vehicle you can afford to take care of this child if you want to. 
provide for this child if you want to. No matter what shame you're experiencing by being pregnant in a place in life when you don't want to be pregnant, there's more shame and guilt in killing that child. <clears throat> don't go forward with it, please. Do what is right. God will help you. If you submit your life to him, he will help you. These people inside, they don't care for you or your child. They're not here to help you. God proved his love for you at the cross. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God proved his love for you at the cross. He did not come to save the righteous, but the sinner. If the righteous be scarcely saved, where will the unrighteous and the ungodly appear? See, even the righteous are scarcely saved. The ungodly and the sinner, where will, where will they appear? In judgment. The Bible says Christ will return with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These ye shall punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Ma'am, are you here to kill your child? Please don't do it. Don't swallow that pill. Don't take that vacuum inside of you to kill your child. And they say on their website, they gently vacuum out the remains of the the fetus, the remains of your uterus. But yet their vacuum is 10 times more powerful than any household vacuum. Tell me that's gentle. They're gonna suck your baby out of the womb. How could you dare go through with it? What would you think if someone put a huge vacuum on top of your head right now and sucked you up into an endless void where you were dead and couldn't live any longer? Would that be righteous? Would that be fair? Would that be just? Of course not. Why does a man who doesn't know you, doesn't know your child, why does a man come here and drive over an hour away early in the morning and make himself look like a fool for your sake and for your child's sake? Is it because I'm crazy? Or is this love compelling me? As I said earlier, if it will help, I will take your child. I will adopt your child. I will take your child into my household. I will raise your child. I will provide for and take care of your child. I already have eight children. One's outside the house now. I have seven still at home. I have much experience being a father and a good one caring for his children, laying down his life providing for his children, teaching his children the truth. And I will, I will adopt your child. It will help you to not kill your child. You see, I'm willing to sacrifice 18 years of my life if you'll sacrifice nine months of yours. 18 years of my life I'm willing to give up that you won't kill your child. You see, if you go through it with knowing that, if you still go through with it, you show how hard-hearted, how cold-hearted, how stiff-necked, how hateful and depraved you are. I'm convinced that if God does not judge America with his fierce wrath, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. We have no record of Sodom and Gomorrah ever committing one abortion. America has spent tens of millions, babies killed, a whole generation wiped out. Imagine all 60 million were allowed to live. We have about 350 million, I think, here in the U.S. now. We have over 400 million people here in the U.S. right now. If none of the babies were killed, these precious babies, and each of my children, I've lost sleep over them. I've prayed for them throughout a night, over and over again. 
I provide for them. I work hard for them. I'll protect them. I'll teach them the truth. There's nothing you could do that could get me to, to dissuade me from protecting my children. But you come here and put your children in harm's way to the slaughter. And then all, all the difficulty, all the trials, all the hard times I've had with my children, and there have been many, are worth it. Are worth it. There's so much greater a blessing. Oh, when I, each child, when I held them for the first time, as they were delivered from my wife's womb, and I held them for the, for the first time, I wept tears of joy. Tears of joy that I cannot explain. That you won't experience because you're going to kill your child here today through abortion. Why? Why would you forsake such blessing? Why would you bring upon yourself such cursings? How can you not see? Oh, open your eyes and see. Open your ears and hear. Soften your heart and receive the truth of the Word of God. That you might walk in it. You may think, well, now I'm going to preserve my life. I'm taking care of this inconvenience today. I'm going to preserve my life the way I want it to be. It's going to be. No one can stop me from doing this. Jesus said, if you hear his words, and you've heard his words today, doubt it not. You've heard his words today from my mouth. If you hear the words of Jesus and do not do them, Jesus said in Matthew 7, he likens you to a man or a woman who built their house upon the sand. The winds and waves come and beat them, blow against the house, and it fell. Your house is going to fall. Your life is going to fall because you're building your life upon the sand. But Jesus said, those who hear my words and do them, I will liken him to one who built his house upon the rock. The winds and waves come and beat and blow against the house, and it stood. And Jesus said, many will come to me on that day talking about Judgment Day. Lord, Lord, have we not done this in your name and that in your name and this in your name? And he will say to them, away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. There's so many people who want to cry out, Lord, Lord. They want to claim Jesus is their Lord. But yet Jesus will say to them, many of them on that day, I do not know you. I do not know you. I've never known you. And you're a worker of lawlessness. See, it's not about knowing about Jesus. Anyone can know about Jesus. I mean, claim to know Jesus, but a question becomes, do you really know him? Do you have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus? Will you forsake and stop your sinning and obey him and live for him and follow him and serve him? He is your only hope. The only hope for sinners is Jesus. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The Bible says, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved except Jesus. There is a salvation to any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And God has given Jesus the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. But is he Lord of your life? Is he ruling and reigning in your life? Are you obeying him and doing what he's commanded you to do? If you can't say that, then he's not your Lord. He's not your Lord if you can't say that. Oh, repent. Give up your sins. Turn to Jesus by faith. Obey Jesus Christ by faith. 
repent of your sins, begin to obey him. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, conditional statement, if you love me, here's a condition, you will keep my commandments. So don't tell me you love Jesus if you don't keep his commandments. If you tell me you love Jesus while you continue in your wickedness and your sin, I can only conclude that Jesus you believe in is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus who is a figment of your imagination. And Jesus who lets you do whatever you want to do and still think you're right with him. When you can't have your sin and have Jesus at the same time. The Jesus of the Bible is righteous. He's holy. He did not even have any deceit in his mouth. The most common sin there is in this world is lying. Some of you lie multiple times every single day. Jesus didn't have deceit in his mouth at all. He was sinless. He was perfect. And he commands you to go and sin no more. Just come to me. All you who labor, you're going to stop your labor from happening, aren't you, women, by having an abortion today? But it's Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, you cling to your sin, which is a heavy burden and a hard yoke. You cling to your sin, which will weigh you straight down to hell someday. But Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle, I am lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's God's offer to you. He offers it to all. So you can go on in your sin, carrying that heavy burden, being under the hard yoke of the devil. Oh, the way of the transgressor is hard. You can continue down that path, and God will give you what you deserve in the end, the lake of fire for all eternity. Or you can repent, come to Christ in humility and repentance, and he will save you, he will change you, he will cleanse you, he will remove from you that heavy burden of sin. He will remove from you that hard yoke of sin and give you a light burden and an easy yoke. His. And you can go through life with his help instead of trying to do it on your own and continuing to fail over and over again. Being feeling crushed under the burden of your sin and the burdens of life. Instead, you can have Christ help you, the God of all the universe on your side, helping you to deal with your difficulties, your trials, your troubles. That's what can happen instead. Ma'am, are you here to have an abortion? Are you here to kill your child? Don't go forward with it, please. Do what is right before God. This is my problem. I am a Christian. I do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. But you don't do that for white people. What are you talking about? You don't do that for white people. You're a, you're a, you're a hypocrite, sir. You're a liar. You you just called me a racist because I'm out here trying to defend the unborn. Sir, I I don't look at the color of people's skin like you do. Okay. Yeah, you looked at my skin and said I'm a racist, sir. You said I'll do this to white people. You don't know who I preach to. Wait, sir, I preach all over the place. You have no idea what you're talking about, sir. I preach all over the place, sir. Say about Jesus Christ. I said to myself, you gave us a white. Jesus is not white, sir. He's not white. That's what they were told to us. Who told you that? They lied to you. They lied to you, sir. He's not white. He doesn't have blue eyes. He doesn't have blonde hair. He's not European. He's Middle Eastern. Shame on you for your false accusations toward me, sir. They were false. Your accusations are false, sir. I don't teach that. 
say you. You pointed at me, sir. You're talking to me. You're taking it the wrong way. No, sir. You're a false accuser, just like the devil. No, I'm not a devil. You're just like the devil. You're falsely accusing me, sir. The Lord Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. Not when you're living your life like that, sir. I don't live my life like that. You're, right now, what's coming out of your mouth, sir, does not confirm your profession about Jesus. Because if you love Jesus, you obey him. If you love Jesus Christ, you'll obey him, sir. Well, maybe you should say it differently, sir. Don't only take it the way you said it. It's amazing the hypocrisy in this world. There isn't a racist bone in my body. But isn't it amazing those who claim black lives matter will kill black lives. Little black lives are killed. But black lives matter, right? Which ones? How about unborn black lives? Do they matter? See, I believe all lives matter, whether, no matter what the skin color is, because Jesus came to die for every tribe, tongue, and nation. Every tribe, tongue, and nation. He desires that all be saved and all come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants all to repent instead of perishing. But you can reject Jesus under racist terms if you want to. It's not going to hold up on Judgment Day before God, that's for sure. People want to make everything in life about skin color. The Bible doesn't even talk about skin color. The Bible doesn't even talk about skin color. The Bible says whether Jew or Greek, whether male or female, slave or free, that salvation is offered to all. Then he commands all men everywhere to repent because there's coming a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. He'll judge the world in righteousness. God is not going to separate us on judgment between black and white. Oh, you're black, you're over here, you're white, you're over here. God's not going to do that. God's going to judge you according to your character. Remember Martin Luther King Jr., what he said? He longed for society where people would not be judged upon the color of their skin, but the character of their life. Well, that's what Jesus Christ is going to do. He's going to judge you according to your character. And let's face it, if you're a sinner, your character is not good. And God is calling you to repent of your evil character. He's calling you to repent of your evil character. Do what is right. And it matters not what the color of your skin is. And that is not what country you're born into. It matters not what your back background and lineage is. It matters not how much or how great your sin is. God is willing, God is able to forgive, to cleanse, to change. No matter who you are, even if you're racist, God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can change you. Contrary to modern popular opinion, racism, which is a sin, is not the unpardonable sin. And contrary to popular opinion, there's very little racism in our world in our day and age. It's not systemic, that's for sure. But you know what is systemic? The killing of unborn babies. That's systemic. Because our system allows it. Our system promotes it. And then the selling of baby parts after the baby is killed. It's become an industry. Just open your eyes and watch some of the undercover videos that have come out in the last few years and see for yourself the facts, the truth, that these places are corrupt. And it doesn't, it shouldn't surprise anyone at how corrupt these places are because they kill babies for a living. They make most of their paycheck off killing babies. So there's no end to how corrupt they could possibly be. What means they will go to to collect as much money into their coffers as possible. But no matter how wicked you've been, no matter how sinful you've been, God is willing, God is able to forgive you even now. If you claim to be a Christian, Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior, the man said in the car. That means nothing. Your profession means nothing. It isn't backed up by what you do. If what comes out of your mouth is wickedness and filth, 
Will you show the state of your heart? And Jesus Christ said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. And then Jesus said this, O oh, brood of vipers, how can you, how can you, being evil, speak good things? O oh, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say unto you, Jesus said, that every idle word men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. The words that come out of your mouth reveal the state of your heart. Last time I was here, I had a man tell me he had three children at home, and he brought his wife here to terminate their fourth child, to kill their fourth child, because he likes killing. Those are the words that came out of his mouth. And I'm here to tell you one thing. If you're here today to kill your child, to terminate the life of your unborn child, then you also like killing. Whether you want to admit it or not. If you didn't like it, you wouldn't be here doing it. Don't deceive yourself. You give your heart what you really want. Whether it's sexual immorality, drunkenness, pot smoking, lying, stealing, a filthy mouth, sexual perversion, murder. You give your life what you truly want. And I'm here to compel you, to influence you, to do what is right. Give your life to Jesus Christ and let him make of your life what you cannot on your own. If I had never come to Jesus 24 years ago, I'd probably be dead by now. I was wicked. Probably more wicked than most of you. But yet Jesus in his mercy, Jesus in his grace, gave me what I did not deserve. His forgiveness, his love, his kindness. The transformation that's found by the power of the Holy Spirit. He offers that to you as well. I'm not trying to influence you to, to reform your life on the outside and think that somehow, some way, you'll make it into heaven because you've had some kind of outward reformation or you start going to a church building I'm here to influence you, to call you to repentance and to faith in Jesus Christ, without which no matter how much outward reformation you have, there will never be salvation for your soul, your eternal soul. So I, would, I plead with you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Do what is right. Come to Christ with a humble, childlike humility, a humble, childlike trust, and cry out to him and he will answer. He will answer. The Bible says that God is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. God is near. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. The Oh God, you will not despise. Come to God in humility and brokenness and repentance and he will not despise it. The world will despise it. The sinful world will mock you and laugh at you. They will despise it. They will despise you. They will despise you for changing while they remain sinners. But God will not despise it. He will hold it up. Remember, if you humble yourself under God's mighty hand, he will lift you up. If you humble yourself, he will give you grace without which you cannot be saved. I plead with you, do what is right. Don't terminate your child's life. Walk out of that place. Drive away from this place. Give them not another second of your time. Give them not another penny of your money. Do what is right. God will bless you. God will bless you for your obedience. He will help you. Come to Christ. Repent, therefore. 
and be converted, that your sins might be blotted out, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. Thank you, sir. You, are you aware that there's a pregnancy center right off the other end of this? I didn't know where it was. I knew it was nearby. PAC on that building up there. Okay. How far away is it, sir? Huh? How far away is it? Right there. So uh, by, right there it says... 531? PAC on the front of the building there. Okay. That's it. 531. Yeah. Okay. Pregnancy aid. I know you've been talking about, you know, getting free help and yes, sir. stuff, and, and uh, like I've got a sign out here that's asking us about a free ultrasound, and they give a free ultrasound up there. Okay. I have a little different approach than you, though. I pray, and I try and get them to come over and give them one of these here. Yes, sir. And this is brochures and stuff in here, but, uh, but God bless you for what you do. Thank you, sir. Well, very strong message. And I was particularly glad to hear you talk about the uh, Black Lives Matter and yes, killing black babies in yeah. here and stuff. It's in my hat. Oh, yes, there you go. I'm born Lives Matter. Where'd you get that at? Online. Where? I got it on the internet, um, yeah. a website, One True God Shop. One True God Shop. Yeah.